Good morning to some and good afternoon to others. My name is Tiffany Harrison, and I'm a research analyst with the Office of Post-Secondary Education here at SREB in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the first webinar in our SREB Open Education Resources Summer Webinar Series, Open Licensing with Creative Commons. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners that in addition to today's webinar, next month we'll be hosting Jeff Gallant with Affordable Learning Georgia, and later this summer we will have Daniel Williamson with OpenStax. You can register for each of these webinars on our website at www.sreb.org slash webinars. I'd also like to note that our sister compact, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, or MEC, has a contract with Creative Commons for existing and custom CC licensing for professional learning opportunities. This contract offers a 15% discount to staff and institutional members of MEC and its sister compacts, which include the New England Board of Edu Higher Education, or NEBI, the Southern Regional Education Board, SREB, and the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, or WICHE. This contract is effective through June of next year. For more information on this contract and the discount through the Technology Contracts Program, uh, you can go to mec.org slash creative dash commons. Today, we are delighted to have with us Jinwen Wetzler, the Director of Learning and Training at Creative Commons. Jinwen develops and manages Creative Commons training programs, including the CC Certificate. She facilitates collaborative projects and partnerships for open education. Prior to Creative Commons, Jinwen, Jinren worked on open policy and open educational resources at the US Department of State piloting OER use for public diplomacy and global partnerships. She's also enjoyed gaining a different perspective of education through international development work in Thailand and Niger. Jinren has a master's in ethics, peace, and global affairs from American University School for International Service. And she lives in Maryland with her husband and children. Jinren enjoys yoga, podcasts, and feeding her more daring friends her cooking experiments. Jen Ren, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here. I'm really glad to, to be kicking off this summer webinar series. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually going to screen share. Um, I think if you don't mind stopping, yeah, then I will, let's see, sorry. Okay. Can everyone see this? Okay, great. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, today, what I wanna do is actually spend as, as much time as possible answering any questions or taking, um, taking some feedback and really saving room for discussion at the end of this. So please do think of questions that you might have for me. And if there's anything that I can't respond to, I'll be happy to, to share your questions with our CC lawyers after this presentation. Okay, and so from the, just from the start, I was very excited to be engaging here because I saw a few different folks from the attendee list from uh, states like Texas and Maryland and um, West Virginia and so on. And these are states that have particularly great uh, advancements in open licensing for education. So I wanted to just very quickly share um, one of our sister organizations, OER state policy tracking information. You can see a great map here in case that's of interest. Um, but there are so many more wonderful initiatives that I know all, um, all of the Southern Compact states are, are working on. And I think it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, so to get started, for those of you who are not familiar with Creative Commons, we are a global nonprofit organization that works towards equitable sharing of knowledge and culture in the public interest. We built and steward the open licenses that power people's unfettered access to education, information, culture, research, et cetera. And we are now in our 20th year. So we are celebrating our 20 year anniversary. And we know that to date, there are over 2 billion CC licensed works across 9 million websites. Um, 
So Creative Commons offers trainings that help people understand um, the ethos of our global shared commons, um, how to work with open licenses. And then we also engage in different advocacy efforts around the world to support equitable open sharing practices. So today, what I wanted to do was give you a very brief snapshot of how you can use our legal tools um, to support your work and maybe the institutions that you represent um, better access and share and build on, on educational resources. And at the end of this webinar, I'll be happy to give you a little bit more information on our, um, our contract with MEC so that you can either register for a training yourself with a discount or share the, um, the information with your colleagues. Okay, before diving into our tools and how you can use them, I wanted to take a quick step back and tell you a story about why it's important and why CC licenses have a bigger impact than we might initially think um, when, when we're first dealing with them. So in 2019, Creative Commons interviewed Medusa, the largest remaining independent news site in Russia. Medusa's investigative reporter, Ivan Golanov, had been arrested on June 6th in 2019 in the center of Moscow. He was persecuted because of his work, likely by the very people he conducted anti-corruption investigations into. And Medusa's immediately they realized that the best possible response to the attack was to put Golanov's work into the spotlight as much as possible. So within a couple of days, the news organization licensed more than 100 of his articles under a Creative Commons attribution license. Hundreds of Russian media outlets republished Golanov's pieces, including national newspapers, lifestyle magazines like Glamour and Men's Health Russia and GQ, feminist websites and various regional press outlets. According to Medusa, this may have been the first time in the history of Russian media that one journalist's articles were published at the same time in every outlet. And it marked a campaign of unprecedented solidarity with Golanov that started with, with journalists, but then later became more widespread to include the general public. And the result was the system gave in. Ivan Golanov was released on June 11th, 2019. Today, we see Medusa using CC licenses again this time to combat censorship and disinformation about the war in Ukraine from the Russian government. All of their content around the war in Ukraine is openly licensed, making it as shareable and accessible to other news organizations and readers around the world as possible. So just for a moment, imagine if we could not access verified information on Ukraine or COVID or any scientific research or academic progress. And then imagine if even more educational research health research or so on was shared legally and freely rather than locked behind paywalls and shared in a way that researchers could be paid and given credit for their advancements. What if every textbook that students bought was more affordable or free? While it's not a silver bullet, using our legal open licenses can support more effective and accessible teaching and learning. It can help researchers more effectively innovate to better address our major challenges, such as climate change and pandemics and so on. So this is what we're passionate about at CC. Creative Commons is here to help, but we also recognize we're part of a set of larger um, open movements that seek to work towards solutions to many of the world's most pressing problems in the spirit of transparency, collaboration, reuse, and free access. Okay. With that context, I wanna dive right into our licenses and their, uh, their context within copyright. So to understand CC licenses, we actually need to understand a very little bit about copyright law. Copyright law is a type of intellectual property law and it was created during the era of the printing press. It was a way to incentivize creators or authors to undertake the arduous time intensive and expensive task of creating works for publishing authors or what we now consider creators, which is anybody who creates music, art, um, PowerPoints, any, any form of creation. Um, uh, but at the time they were defined as authors. Authors were given the right to copy, hence copyright. So copyright grants a set of exclusive rights to copyright owners, which means that no one else can copy, distribute, perform, adapt, or otherwise use the work without permission of the copyright holder. Now, there are some exceptions, 
but this is this is good to know. So think of copyright as a set of rights that are bundled together and offered to only the copyright holder. Also important to know in the US, copyright is automatic once you've developed your original work of creative expression and fixed it in tangible form. So in a number of other countries, you don't need that fixation, but in the US, you need original work fixed in tangible form. It's also worth noting that generally, copyright is automatic around the world. It does not apply to facts or ideas, only the creative expression of them. And it lasts a very long time. So around the world, the, the duration of copyright protection ranges. Uh, the minimum standard is or most countries is the life of the author or creator plus 50 years after their death. In the US, it's life of the author plus 70 years after their death. So it lasts a very long time. And I raise all of these points about copyright because it's very important to know who has the authority to grant permissions to a creative work. That, that's um, a key note for Creative Commons licenses as well. Okay, so now let's talk about Creative Commons licenses. So where copyright is considered all rights reserved, remember all of those rights were bundled together and reserved for the copyright owner, Creative Commons licenses are considered some rights reserved. That is, they unbundle some of those rights and allow copyright owners to determine which rights to offer downstream users. As mentioned, copyright law was created during the era of the printing press, but it hasn't been updated recently enough to account for all of the new options for flexible sharing and reuse of creative works that the internet affords. So CC licenses enable creators to offer more permissions than traditional copyright, given these increased permissions or flexibilities and freedoms that we have with the internet. They're legal tools to support creators. Uh, the permissions last the duration of our uh, traditional copyright, and they're enforceable just as traditional, traditionally copyrighted material is enforceable. In some cases, um, enforceability may be easier um, where you register your work at a copyright office, just as it is for standard copyright materials. And CC licenses have been designed and vetted by legal experts and aligned to international copyright laws. Okay, so that's a little bit of context about our licenses. Now we're gonna dive into the particular licenses that we have, as well as the legal tools. We have six different licenses you can see the icons represented here, um, as well as the two public domain tools that we'll talk about in a moment. To understand how each of these licenses works, it's helpful to kind of break down their purposes. So there are four different elements or kind of permissions or restrictions, depending on how you look at it, um, that underlie our licenses. The four license elements are, and you can see them here, by, SA, NC, and ND. So the by element is represented by the, the little person with a circle around it. This means attribution or something is by someone. Attribution is a specific form of giving credit to the original creator, which must be followed when using or adapting the work. So for example, if I were to make a finger painting, I'm looking at my son's finger painting um, above this camera. If I were to make a finger painting, and um, want to share it with anyone, I could do so and add the, the CC BY license to my work. That would mean that if you wanted to reuse the finger painting, make a collage with it and, and a number of other works, you'd be able to. Um, you would still have to give me credit for my original work, however. So the CC BY element is actually um, the one commonality among all of our licenses. All of our licenses require that you give attribution or credit to the original creator or author of your work. Okay, beyond that commonality, the licenses vary whether they allow for commercial use, whether the work can be adapted, and if so, on what terms. So the next icon that you see is this little arrow that's kind of looping back on itself, and that's our share alike element. This means that all derivative work must be shared with the same license. That is, you can't add or remove restrictions or permissions to, um, to a work that has a CC BY SA license on it. So an example of that would be, let's say I licensed my finger painting CC BY SA, where I had the little person icon with the, 
the arrow icon, you would then in your collage need to license your collage CC by SA as well, so that you weren't imposing additional restrictions for downstream users. That's me saying, I want to offer forth my creative work to the world, but I want to do so in a way that doesn't allow others to more freely or more on limited terms um, share it with others. Okay, the next element is the dollar sign with a slash through it. This, are, this is our non-commercial element, NC. So this means that permission for commercial usage rights are withheld. So one way of thinking about this is if I were offering forth my finger painting, um, I would be saying with an NC license, I want to make money off of this somehow, but I don't want anyone else to. So if you're welcome to make any kind of murals or collages or um, otherwise use my finger painting, but I'm the only one who can try to make commercial gain off of this. You can't, you can't then sell your version of my painting for money. And the, the important thing to remember there is it's not dependent on the user, it's dependent on the use of the work. So you could be a nonprofit using my finger painting for commercial gain, and you would be infringing on my copyright. Or you could be a, a for-profit entity using my non-commercial finger painting for a non-commercial use, like a um, staff development training or, or some kind of internal use, and that would not infringe copyright. So it really do, it comes down to the use case for this, this element. And then we have the equal sign with, with the circle around it. That's the no derivatives element. This simply means that work can be shared, but it has to remain unchanged. So you'd be welcome to use my finger painting for any kind of um, gallery, exhibit, opening, or whatever you wanted to. Um, but you would not be able to make adaptations to that. I'd need you to preserve the, the original painting as it was. Okay, as mentioned, all of the licenses that you'll see in a moment include the CC BY condition. Uh, this is a, um, a requirement also of copyright law. Whenever you use a, um, a piece of creative work, you need to give attribution to the copy, to the author. And now let's turn to the public domain dedications as well as a little bit more context. Okay, so here you see um, a green chart. At the very top of the chart are the two public domain dedications. So there's the C with a slash through it, that's a public domain mark. Then you have CC0, which is um, not a license, but a legal tool. This helps you waive all of your rights to copyright in a work, effectively dedicating your work to the public domain. So a lot of institutions and creators use this to um, offer forward their work in the most flexible way possible. They're not requiring any attribution. They are simply putting forth their work into that kind of vast pool of our human knowledge and creativity that um, helps people kind of iterate and innovate on and kind of use with um, the, the greatest flexibility. So an example of this is um, scientific data. A lot of people, a lot of institutions put scientific data into the public domain so that others can um, make the most use of the scientific data um, for new scientific break breakthroughs. SpaceX, for example, released all of their images of space into the public domain using CC0. Um, similarly, NASA, a government agency, um, released all of their, their work into essentially the public domain as well. All right. So the, the public domain mark is a little bit different. This is more of a, a label used to mark works known to be free of copyright restrictions globally. So it's a little bit harder to determine what is free of copyright restrictions worldwide, given the difference in durations of copyright protection in different countries. But it's helpful to know when you see this public domain mark, it's likely meaning that you can use, you can use the work at hand um, for any purpose without giving credit to the original author. Um, it would just likely 
I mean, you, you need to double check that. Just make sure that it is in fact in the public domain. That would be a recommendation. Okay, so this chart ranges from least restrictive to most restrictive. You see the the two markers for the public domain are the least restrictive, obviously, because they have no copyright restrictions. They exist outside the realm of copyright law, all the way down through our licenses, going from our CC BY license to our CC BY SA license to the, the licenses that have some um, restrictions on use, our CC BY NC, CC BY NCSA, to our um, ND licenses down at the bottom. But all of our licenses are still more permissive than all rights reserved copyright. Again, they all work within the realm of, um, of copyright law, but they are more flexible than traditional copyright. Okay, and the I think the only other thing to note here is that um, which license users choose really depends on their own needs. So there are advantages and disadvantages to all of the licenses depending on your vantage point. Okay. I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any questions. And it looks like I will be sharing slides. Yes, thank you for, for asking. They're um, CC by license, so you are welcome to um, reuse them as you like. Um, just give me, well, give Creative Commons credit. And um, yes, the chart is also available online. I can also um, share a, a couple other links to relevant resources afterward that, that might be helpful, such as our, our FAQ page. Thank you for these questions right off the bat. This is great. And just keep them coming as they come in. I, I am eager to, to hear what's most helpful to you all. Okay, so now let's dive a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the licenses. So CC licenses are um, you can communicate about CC licenses in three main ways. So the first way is kind of the considered the legal code or the, the lawyer readable terms. And those are, um, that's the, the license code that is used um, for, um, for lawyers and is legally enforceable in court. So I'm happy to, to give an example of that. That's kind of the legalese that's hard for non-lawyers to read at times. So that we also provide the common deeds. So this is kind of the human readable version of the license that um, that is not enforceable in itself, but that links to the the legal legally enforceable layer. And you can you can also see an example of that. I'll just post um, an example of the human readable um, layer right here and. Here we post the lawyer readable version there. The third is our machine readable layer. So this is the, the layer that, um, that makes the license discoverable by software online. So the machine readable version summarizes the key freedoms granted and or obligations imposed in a format that is searchable by search engines and um, other web applications. And this is what makes our tools really relevant in this digital age. Um, we also work really closely with institutions to get the marking of our licenses and the placement right within their larger systems. So if any of you are looking to um, not just apply CC licenses to individual pieces of educational content, but maybe make a website that is um, that is openly licensed, um, we're happy to work with you. Okay, we're going to take a quick look at our CC license chooser, which, which is the way that we recommend right now um, for most people who don't maybe have time for like our full training to openly license their own works. So we have a license chooser that basically asks you some very simple questions and it helps you determine what would best suit your needs for open licensing. So I think for the interest of time, I'm not gonna have us go through um, a little practical exercise on this, but I will show the chooser. Let me just, there it is right here. 
Okay, so this is what the the traditional chooser looks like. You see the box in the left side of um, of the web page, and in that box, you're asked two questions. You have to ask yourself, do I want adaptations of my work to be shared? And you can say yes, no, or maybe, but as long as other people share it with the same terms. And that will reflect the license that you, you then choose. After you answer that question, you have, to, you have to determine if you want commercial uses of your work to be allowed. So that is, do you want others to have the chance to profit from a version of your work or not? You can say yes, you can say no, and that will reflect the, the license that's best um, used for your needs. So the license here, based on the questions I responded to just randomly, was our CC BY NCSA license. <clears throat> the way to use it is to scroll down to this bottom section and literally copy and paste the code on your, your web page or copy and paste the language and the icon right here and put it on your educational material. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the easiest way to do things. In our certificate training, we give you a little bit more guidance on how to, <clears throat> how to set up a, a licensing statement that would really help downstream users take most advantage of your materials, know your name, know the title of the, the work you're putting forward, and so on. Um, there's also a chooser beta that is, um, it's not out of beta yet. It hopefully will be at some point. Um, but this is a version of the license chooser that can help you think through a lot of the other questions behind um, determining the license that you might want to choose or use on your work. So this is <clears throat> a little bit more in depth in terms of the questions you have to answer, but also gives you a little bit more of a detailed um, synopsis of what's going on. So again, I would love to spend a little bit more time on this, but I do want to save time for Q&A. So I will leave this here. I'm going to share this link um, also after the, um, the webinar ends, and I'll put it here in the chat. OK. Um, so now let's talk about not just what we can do to apply a license to our own work, and determine what works for, for our own creation, but how we best work with others open licensed materials. So <clears throat> this might seem like a simple question. How do we reuse others open licensed works, right? And this actually depends on um, whether you are using someone else's work in unadapted form or whether you're making an adaptation. So let's say, and I'll just for the sake of this presentation, I'll show you my my son's finger painting. I've never actually shown this anyone this, but I love it. Let's say I want to offer forward this finger painting. Others can reuse it depending on my license if it's in this form or if it's cut up into a million different pieces and turned into some kind of mosaic by someone else. But it depends um, on how they use it and what license um, what license I have on it already. Um, those two things will determine um, the license that they apply. So if you're using another person's work in unadapted form, it's considered collection content. Your collection can technically be licensed, um, any license that you prefer. It does not affect the license permissions of the works used in your collection. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but for the, the purpose of this very brief overview, we'll, we'll keep it very simple like that. If you're making an adaptation of a work or what we call a remix or a derivative, the, if you're changing the original work in a way that is sufficiently original in itself, then you have different considerations um, for your own license. That's when it gets significantly more complicated. So the license you apply must still honor the license permissions of the works you use to create your new work. So this may sound simple, but it can get pretty tricky quickly. Um, so just to give a very brief example, um, the image you see here is an image of bubbles. And this was uh, taken from another, actually, whoops, you're not seeing it. The image you see here <laughs> in the PowerPoint is an image of bubbles. It's taken from a mosaic by someone who licensed their work CC by NCSA, all right? 
So seems simple enough. I'm sharing it in unadapted form. I've given permission or I've given credit to the creator, but if you have one work that is maybe unadapted, but used in a way that is sufficiently original, perhaps in this mosaic of something else, in this case, a bubble, um, it may be hard to determine if this is a collection or a remix. And here's another example. Millions of different pictures used for a completely different end, and yet they're not actually adapted. That's just one example, but there are tons of examples of um, some of the considerations and complexities around reuse of open license content. And that's where we, um, we come in. So we have a lot of support resources for you. We have an FAQ page. We have our wiki pages on recommended practices. And we also, as mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, run the CC certificate, which is a 10 week online course or one week in person or online boot camp that trains people specifically on these kinds of things. So it trains people on open licensing, reuse of other open license materials, and what it means to engage in the larger knowledge and culture commons online. So how you can contribute to this, this sharing space. And because of our academic contract with MEC, we are happy to offer any of you the 15% discount or your colleagues the 15% discount on course registrations. So I've got a little bit more about the course uh, in the link you see right here, I'll post that also in the chat. And then I also, in case anyone's interested, wanted to share a little bit more about the, the different training opportunities that are afforded under this MEC contract with us. So the, the last link that I shared um, describes the professional learning opportunities and the way that you can receive the MEC discount um, when you register. For a course. So our next courses start in June and then following that September. We offer them three times a year, January, June, and September every year. And we have courses for academic librarians, for educators, for um, our culture, cultural heritage professionals. Uh, we call them GLAM professionals, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and then we, we run trainings for all different professionals. Um, so I think I want to I want to end it there. Just letting you know again that we have a number of different really wonderful resources to support you. We have trainings that we can create for, for institutions. We have our standard CC certificate course. And as always, we're always um, available for, for questions or for more information. And um, I'll have my, my email available in a moment as well. OK, I'm going to stop there. Are there any questions? Tanrin, we did have a question come in through the chat that says, if you're using a piece from another with the share alike choice, do you also have to include share alike on yours then? Yes. <laughs> um, if you, I will say that with a big caveat, however, <clears throat> if you are using your, um, if you are using a share alike work in a remix or adaptation, so a work of your own that's sufficiently original, then you would need to offer it forward with a share alike um, element on it as well. Yes, you can't add restrictions or permissions onto your work because that, um, that would infringe on the original permissions or restrictions of the, um, the original licensed material that you were using. If you are using an essay licensed work in a collection, for example, so in an unadapted form with other works in unadapted form, technically you would not need to license your work with an essay license. This is this is the technical response, but we always encourage you to make it as easy as possible for downstream users to honor the permissions of the works used um, wherever you can. So wherever possible, you want to make sure that not only you are honoring the, the permissions of the, the works that you use, but you are making it very clear to downstream users what is considered um, under the essay license in your collection and what is not, what can be reused um, for other purposes and what cannot. Hopefully that helps. 
And there's actually okay. a really wonderful, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute, a wonderful chart that might, um, yeah, that might help in our frequently asked questions page. I don't know if this probably doesn't come up to the right um, chart, but if, if you just do a, a find for chart, you can scroll down and, and take a look at a couple of our different charts that really um, detail what's permitted and what's not, depending on your uses. Okay, hey, we have another question um, in our question and answer um, page that says, for employees such as university faculty, where the employer might have an interest in intellectual property their employees create, how should the employee proceed in terms of licensing work they want to share broadly? Workplace legal counsel may not always be well-versed in uh, Creative Commons and the open ed movement. So how, what's the best way for them to, to move forward with that? That's such a great question. So this is something that comes up in our courses too. And it's interesting in the US in particular, we have this work for hire doctrine. This means, and let me first say, I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, but our, our general takeaways are always read your contracts with your employer, understand what you are legally obligated to do in your contract, there um, ideally is a, you know, some section of the contract that outlines who has the copyright to the, the works that you create under your employment. If it does not, it, yeah, it, it is likely worth a conversation with your, your lawyers to determine what's possible. And yes, I mean, lawyers are, are often um, like there to do the due diligence. They, they want to mitigate risks. So they would not want to likely incur risks for something that they're not used to. But the, what we found is the more people who get accustomed to CC licenses, not just in the US, but globally, the more um, willing people are to, to try using them in different cases and, and experiment and so on. So if it's helpful, we can connect you to other folks who have been in communication with their, their lawyers about you know, the work for hire doctrine, what specifically they're allowed to, to create under their contracts and otherwise. We also have a really wonderful um, database of case law um, around CC licenses. So um, this, I think, would be a, a good resource for, um, for anyone worried about incurring risk because um, CC licenses hold up in law. There are plenty of examples um, to draw from, and I think a really wonderful set of community members in our, our global network that would be available to help anyone who's interested in, you know, sharing recommended practices and so on beyond that. Hopefully awesome. that answers. Okay, well, we'll leave that open to the chat and hopefully that did answer the question. Um, another question we have, um, kind of following up from uh, the share alike is how intentional does sharing alike have to be? You know, how broadly does um, must a derivative be distributed for it to count as share alike? Let's see. So I probably can't uh, determine that. I wish I could. I. And I, I'm happy to put you in touch with um, one of our um, our legal counsel. Um, yeah, someone from our legal counsel. But I mean, as far as I know, people are expected to do whatever is considered reasonable in abiding by the CC licenses, whether they are initial users or users far downstream of a given work. It's kind of, it's on them to abide by the law, right? And that's true of um, copyright licensed works or all rights reserved copyright. That's true of CC licensed work. Um, so I think I'm not a lawyer. I can't, I can't give any kind of legal advice on this, but I would imagine it would be up to the individual user um, how their use is um, 
how much their use is reasonably abiding by the license terms. Okay, all right, thank you. Hopefully that's not uh, a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question um, from, it looks like Daniel Wilson. You mentioned for-profits being able to use non-commercial non works for nonprofit purposes, but the concern that I've had often seen is that since the school is for-profit, then using the materials in the classroom is potentially a for-profit use as the school is profiting off of it. Is that completely off base or is it a valid concern? What, what say you? No, I think that's a really good question. I mean, it gets, um, it gets to be really challenging when you have um, sort of mixed uses or you have a, an institution um, that, yeah, that may have, I, I guess, mixed uses. So I would say um, I think there is some flexibility where, where institutions use educational resources that um, have the non-commercial clause in a way that recoups costs versus makes um, commercial gain. So if there was a way to, to basically defend the use case and say that this is used for non-commercial purposes in this non-commercial space, then that would make sense, I think. Um, but yeah, it can be murky. I know there are a, a number of cases where um, even for-profit um, for profit campus bookstores sell NC licensed um, books, but I think they have to do so in a way that they don't make commercial gains. So they have to kind of recoup costs of operations, but nothing more. Um, yeah, let me see. I'm just going to reread this question in the chat so I make sure I'm answering it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a valid concern. I think it points to some of the um, the nuances that require a lot more consideration and and sometimes some legal review within an institution. So thank you for asking that, Daniel. Okay, we had another question that, well, more so of a statement, but hopefully you can speak to it a, a bit. Um, since I'm confused about using things like blogs that cite other works, the blog might might not have any licensing requirements, but the cited works makes me hesitant to use it. What can you what can you offer us on on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I like that because it touches on a couple of different points that um, come up in our our training course. So first, a blog is a presumably um, a creative endeavor, right? We're we're issuing forth a creative work sufficiently original on our own. We are fixing it in tangible form online, and therefore it is. Um, automatically copyright protected. So that in itself could have a CC license attached to it. Otherwise, people would just have to assume that it's all rights reserved copyright and using parts of the blog or copying the whole blog or someone would infringe on the blogger's copyright. Um, second, there is a, a sometimes confusing at first difference between works cited and attribution. So when we talk about um, when we talk about copyright, we're talking about attribution. Attribution is giving the specific credit to the creator of a, a, a creative work. Work cited is a good academic practice. So it, it's so that people don't plagiarize, for example. Well, no, that is why they use it. Um, and it, it supports you know downstream users or readers finding additional information on, on a given topic. Um, one, is, one is breaking law um, if, you don't inf if you don't abide by it. And the other is you know, breaking good academic practice. Um, you can have attribution and citation combined or separately, but at the very least to abide by copyright law, you need to attribute works um, that you use, um, their license and their their author. Um, 
So it, it may seem intimidated to use the work cited from a, um, a blog or I guess, yeah, engage with blog content like that, but just keep in mind, um, yeah, that they are, they're slightly, the work cited is slightly different from um, attribution. And I can get you a great link to that following this if you'd like, just contact me. Okay. Uh, we had another question in our question and answer area that says, how does Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons uh, and contributing for photographers not get into legal trouble for CC licensed photos without model or property releases, but allowing commercial use um, and, and on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons and downloadable use for anyone else where the photos contain recognizable people or property that have additional rights not addressed by? CC. Great question. Okay, let me address that in reverse order. The, the logos or people identified in photos. Um, so when we started um, talking about CC licenses, I was couching this within intellectual property law, uh, copyright law in, in particular. Copyright law is just one form of IP law. There's trademark law, there's patent law, um, and others. So um, logos, for example, are not protected by copyright law, they're protected by trademark law. So that, that you're right, that would not be something that um, CC licenses would speak to. Um, in terms of how Wikimedia Commons deals with, with photos and so on, they, they're an incredible resource that makes sure the author upload or the, the creator uploading the, the content um, agrees that this content is CC by SA licensed. So they, um, I think they put the onus on the person uploading the, the content. And then it's also incumbent on all of us as users of the commons to make sure that the, the content we're using is um, honoring the permissions of the, the original photographer or creator or so on. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there was any I'm, I don't see that question, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, to that question that I might not be touching on. Was that, did that answer? Okay. I think so. Um, so we've got about three or four more questions. I'm just kind of going in the order between the chat and the question and answer area. Um, we have uh, a question that says more of a curiosity than anything else, but I've had faculty ask this. How much do they have to share just with their own students more broadly? How, how does, how's that? That's, oh, that's a really fun question. And we could spend an entire a second webinar on this. I think it's it's so fascinating to look at um, that kind of question because it it's more about behavioral change and cultural change. It's not necessarily about the technical specifications of um, you know license permissions. I think how much people would feel comfortable sharing is like what this is really um, about. Um, I think a lot of times faculty when they're initially discovering this new or different approach to education, which is sharing based, may be nervous at first to, to try it. I mean, a lot of times people, um, and rightly so, I think um, are used to a paradigm where their, uh, you know, their currency is their um, intellectual creations. And at the same time, CC licensed works do not challenge people's um, people's currency in that way. They offer a greater chance for um, for citation counts in academic publications. The more people have access to um, an academic publication, the more likely they are to to cite it or to reuse it in some way and give attribution in a, a following publication. So I think. Um, how much faculty share is one up to their personal preference um, and willingness to test out a different paradigm of education, and two, subject to the um, to their contract with their employer. So what they're allowed to share may be dependent on what their employer determines 
I, when I first started working at Creative Commons, I was coming from the government where um, there is kind of a default to close hold on information unless it, uh, unless, um, unless a particular bit of information is, you know, meant for public consumption and, and so on. Um, and I would say it was, it was a bit of a leap for me to go from um, an assumption that we we don't share to this assumption that not only do we share everything, all of our all of our um, certificate course content is openly licensed and available online for anyone at any time. Um, but we encourage people to to use the works. We love seeing our work being remixed and repurposed for different uh, opportunities and so on. Um, that's a little bit of a tangent, but I do want to share an example of how um, powerful it was for me um, to see the result of open sharing after coming from a closed sharing institution beforehand. So here, I'm gonna post a link to our certificate program webpage where you can access all of our licensed materials, all of our open licensed content. If you scroll down, you will see that not only did someone decide to make an audio version of our work that made it far more accessible to so many um, additional audiences, but we had um, at the very bottom, we decided to make a, an attribution template so that people would be able to adapt it even further. Since then, we've found people are translating it into different languages. We have the certain six different languages, including English, with two additional language translations coming this year. We have different programs that have taken bits and pieces of our, our training and adapted it in, in different ways and then cited back to um, the CC certificate, giving us an even broader audience than we initially expected. So I see the ripple effect of open sharing as something so powerful and so far beyond what I, I initially expected. I would say from my own personal perspective, the more faculty are feel comfortable sharing, the better. But I recognize every case is different, and you know I don't have to deal with tenure and promotion policies, for example. So hopefully, okay. that helps. Yeah, fantastic. All right, we're we're coming down to the wire. We've got two <laughs> questions up left. Let's see. Um, so does all of this mean that we're able to print for our students? Would charging only the cost of printing be okay under these rules? That's a good question. So this is also something that gets into um, some of the, the nuances that, that are brought up in the course. In the US, you have um, you have something, it's a an exception to copyright called fair use, which allows for some limited reuse of copyrighted content. Um, for educational purposes, among others, given certain um, factors. So there's a four-factor test that you have to kind of abide by. Anyway, this is all to say, even for, for all rights reserved copyright content, you may be able to, um, you know, I should, I should back up and say, I'm not a lawyer. I cannot respond to this um, in full, but I know there, um, there have been, um, there have been legal cases to support people using um, CC licensed content, recouping um, print costs, and um, yeah, printing out content for for participants or students. Excellent. Let me just make sure I'm yeah. I'll share the um, the case law on that if it's of interest. Great, that would be wonderful. All right, our last question is, if multiple OER sources are remixed together, to what extent do we need to make it clear where one source ends and another begins, especially if things are blended and more than, you know, just simply cut and pasted? Oh, this is, this is a great question. This is in itself a reason to take the course, not to keep promoting the course, but this is something that um, ends up being very, very complicated. And um, the thing that I will leave you with here is the most important thing to do in your um, 
remixes is or your collections or some regardless of how you reuse the work is making sure to ideally give credit to the author so you you recognize the author you provide the title to the original work the license of the original work and the source so that downstream users are able to go back to the original source and double check that they can then um you know abide by the the original permissions offered and recognize the author and and so on so if you if you can step back and try to not get hung up on where um, one original work ends and the next one begins and and so on and just remember our goal is to honor the permissions of the original license holder so you want to bring forth those permissions and make it as easy as possible for the next user to um, to abide by them as well um, then hopefully that will help so remember tassel t-a-s-l title author source and license the more you can share that in your work the better the license that you then apply to your own work gets more complicated but we can talk about that at nauseum Excellent. Jen Ren, thank you so much, not only for all the information that you provided, but for uh, expertly answering all of the questions that um, have been asked here today. This is actually the conclusion of our uh, webinar for today. Um, so again, thanks to Jen Ren for um, sharing all of her creative common licensing information with us. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be posted on our website at sreb.org probably next week. And um, if you have any other um, questions for Jen Ren, we will also share her contact information so that you can reach out to her. Uh, again, uh, there is information about the course that Jen Ren was referring to uh, at mech.org slash creative commons. And just one last reminder to please uh, join us for our other two webinars in our OER webinar summer series. And you can register for um, those other webinars at our website at sreb.org slash webinars. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you to all of our participants and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks.